recording. So, hi everybody, for those of you who don't know me, um, I feel like I need to be formal with what's probably going to be 250 people on this call. Um, my name is Karen Roy, I am the co-chair of the TMF Reference Model, chair the steering committee, and I'm very delighted, as you can see, I like celebrating TMF Reference Model. Those who haven't seen this, we're 10 years old. Um, um, hopefully I started talking, didn't start talking too quickly. Um, so um, what we're going to be doing today is really focusing on version 3.2 of the TMF reference model. So we're very excited about that. We've got a lot of people to present. I'm going to throw run through some um, logistics. First of all, I will turn my video off, um, but just wanted you to see for those of you who haven't met me before. Hello. Um, OK, so let's dive straight in and get on with the meeting. So this is what today is about, a, a very quick update on the membership and the initiatives. And then the most of today is going to be on version 3.2 of the reference model. I'm very pleased to say that we have four people on the panel. This is interactive. For those of you who haven't been to these calls before, please do, we've got a chat, post, a cha post in the chat, um, anything you want to ask, anything you want to say, it's lovely to hear from everybody. So please don't 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 um, sit too quietly. We do want to know um, anything that there's any questions you want to ask. So membership, just a very quick update on the membership um, where we are. These are just the basic numbers of the members um, in terms of the project team members for the, just a very quick um, up, um, sort of summary for those of you who are new to this. Um, initiative or new to the meeting, we have two different or well, three different ways that you can effectively be part of the reference model. There's the project team members, which is groups.io, and this is where people are involved in active initiatives. And the steering committee are people that are involved in active initiatives, and that's where we look to get new steering committee members from. We also have subscribers, and the subscribers join the website and they get updates from us. So they get emails from myself, from Eldon, who's the administrator, or from you know, any other um, group information that we send around. We also have a LinkedIn group, which is not formally linked to membership, but we do have 3,200 people on that group. Um, if you want, if you're not involved, please write this down httptmfrefmodel.com forward slash join, go in and click on join at minimum, become a subscriber. Um, but if you wanna get involved in a project, then please click on the groups.io and pick a project. So a couple of nice graphics, Eldon gave me some good numbers last time, so that was quite useful to see. This is the membership split by type of organization. Um, so we do have a few people from health authorities and agencies, but the majority of the people are Pharma biotech, so that's 51%, CROs and vendors. And obviously this will all be recorded and these slides will be available. Sometimes this is very useful if you want to try and persuade your organization to use the reference model. The other thing is location, um, very heavily weighted towards the US um, and the UK. Germany and Canada have a, a significant number and then the, everybody else has merged together. They were too many countries to put in and split everybody out. Um, uh, I think it's interesting that it is, is, is weighted quite strongly as this, probably because when we started off recruiting people into this, a lot of it was, was driven from the US conferences. Um, and I do apologize that the meeting time changed to fit the UK time when actually the majority, or European time, when actually the majority of, of people are in the US. But as of next week, we're all back on the same time zone. So there's a few um, active initiatives. There's not very many going on at the moment. So sub artifacts we are releasing as part of 3.2. So you'll see it today and we'll talk a lot about it. Devices, um, there is a uh, updated devices um, part of the reference model, which is going to be released in 2021. It's not part of 3.2. Um, and so if anybody specifically has an interest in device, they could always do with some extra reviewers. And then there's the exchange mechanism. Now, hoping that we have Paul on, uh, Paul Fenton, who, yes, he is, excellent. Paul, can I put your slide here? Would you mind just touching sure. on the survey? Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Yep, perfect. Great. So um, as, as a exchange mechanism group, we've put together a survey really um, to, to try and help us better understand people's perceptions, any, any barriers 
um, uh, the value and the intentions for the implementation of this standard. Um, just, just very quickly for those of you that have not heard about it, it's it's basically a, a standard to facilitate the exchange of TMF content between organizations and between TMF systems. So we'd love everybody to go in and respond to the survey. It takes about 10 to 12 minutes. Um, and there are different questions for different groups. So if you're a vendor, you'll see different questions than say for a sponsor or CRO or a consultant. Um, but it's really going to be very useful for us if we can get this information from you uh, and we'll present the, the results probably at one of these meetings um, at the beginning of next year. Um, so we already um, have prepared an email with a link to the survey which is going out today. May have already gone out, I'm not sure, but um, if no, it hasn't... I can, I can tell you that Alden's just pinged me to say that it's scheduled to go out at 4.55 today. Okay, so, so in, in other words, in, 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 a, 50, in 50 minutes. 50 minutes. Okay, so in 50 minutes, look at your inbox because there'll be a link there uh, to the survey and, and please uh, give us your input. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. No, thank you very much, Paul. The, and uh, we do have one question. Are the questions more IT or business? Um, both. Uh, so if it depends on what type of organization you work for. If you work for a CRO uh, or for, um, for a, uh, a biotech or pharma company, um, we'll be asking you sort of business questions. If you're working for a vendor, um, there will also be some technical questions, but it's, it's designed for everybody. So everybody should go and fill it in. Fantastic. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Paul. Right. So, um, and do remember that sometimes these emails get stuck in spam. So go and have a look in your junk email as well, just to see if maybe some of the emails from, my, I know that mine sometimes get caught. So be careful about that. Okay, so uh, just a very quick comment on initiatives. Now, we are specifically looking to think about new initiatives. You all very kindly filled in a survey this year, um, and there was a section in there where there were a number of different things that people said were a good idea, um, but we'd really love to hear from you. Um, it's very simple, even while you're just sitting here listening to us talk, if you think of something that you think that would be a good idea, just email me, kroy at flexglobal.com um, and I'll pull them all together and we'll talk about them in steering committee. Um, we, we would like to start some more active initiatives and we would love to have some ideas from you. So this is your chance to speak up and say what you would like to do. So kroy at flexglobal.com, email me today while you're sitting here thinking so you don't even have to go away and think about it. And no idea is a bad idea, I promise. Okay, so without further ado, I would like to talk um, handover for version 3.2. So we've had this uh, version 3.2 has been led um, very nicely by a lady called Joanne Malia from Regeneron and a lady called Kay Robinson from Odinate. And so Joanne, I'm going to hand over to the two of you. I'm not sure who's doing which, but just tell me as you want me to move slides on and I will do them for you. Sure. Um, Karen, can you hear me? Absolutely. Perfectly. Okay, um, if you can go to the next slide. Yep. Okay, I'd like to announce in case you hadn't noticed that um, reference model 3.2.0 is going to be released November 2nd um, of 2020. So um, what does that include? Um, it includes all of the approved requests that have submitted and um, until June of this year. Um, those uh, um, requests that have been received since June are currently in the process of evaluation. It wasn't that we um, forgot your requests. It's just that we do have to have a time um, by which we um, finish our evaluation and compile all of those requests into the reference model and um, send out um, the actual um, updates. Um, so what is included? There's one new artifact, um, four changes to artifact names, um, a change to the filing level, 22 changes to artifact def definition, milestones, glossary, all the rest of the stuff. And one um, important um, addition is the addition of the sub artifacts, um, the in um, complete set. Um, additionally, we wanted to point out that the alternate name column has been retired. 
and it's actually replaced by the new recommended sub artifacts column. Um, for those of you who use this to um, help with your internal teams, you may want to retain this in your internal um, you know, reference model, index, um, whatever you call it. Um, I do know that some people use this either across divisions or um, with different partners, such as their CROs or vendors. Next slide. Okay, here's a, a little bit more information. Um, what you will be receiving on November 2nd is the um, TMF reference model version 3.2.0. And along with that will be the release notes that will explain um, hopefully what those changes were um, so that you can understand um, where we were coming from. Um, just so that you understand also what the Change Control Board has actually been doing with these different um, releases. Uh, for release 3.1, there were 22 change, uh, excuse me, 23 changes. And this one includes 25 um, along with these um, sub artifacts. Uh, we had received 31 that we've rejected either um, because it didn't really follow with the model, the sub uh, or the zone teams had disagreed, or maybe there was just a, um, a, a disconnect with that particular individual not understanding um, something with the reference model. But uh, there are 27 open and they are going to be considered for the next release. They're already sitting with the zone teams and there are five that have been deferred. Um, so we'll be revisiting those now that we have a little bit more information or um, discussing them further with the steering committee. Okay, next slide. Okay, um, what I did um, for the following slides was basically give a little bit more detail as to what those actual changes are. Um, for the new artifact, we've added uh, an artifact to deal with non-IP storage documentation. So the things that you do need to send along um, for your study teams um, that may not be IP related, but you do need to um, maintain some storage condition information. Next slide. And these are the changes to the artifact names. They're, um, in most cases, relatively minor. Um, but for most of these changes, it was for consistency across the model. Next slide. And here we have um, the changes to the filing level. We've added the monitoring plan, um, also to the site level um, documents, as some companies do include this. And we've changed the debarment statement to a different milestone, um, which is number two, the clinical infrastructure ready. Okay, next slide. These are the um, artifacts that have had some minor changes to their definition or purpose. Um, and in most cases, I think the change is self-explanatory. We did try to um, put in the release notes what the changes were in red so that it will make it easier for you. Next slide. Um, there were four changes to the glossary um, or to the model overview itself. So feel free to take a look at those. Next slide. And there were eight artifacts with revised ICH codes. Um, these may have been just an oversight or a, uh, a typo, um, but we have corrected those. And thanks to all those who point those out. I um, really give you a lot of credit for uh, finding a lot of these things. Thanks a lot. Next slide. And just as a reminder, um, if you do have any feedback or would like to request a change, please go to the below um, address and feel free to let us know what you think or um, 
if you do think that something needs to be changed. We consider all requests. Next slide. Yeah. Yep. Joanne, I wonder, um, I think the next slide, yes. Yeah, so uh, okay. I wondered if you could maybe just do a quick two minute overview about the change control board so people understand who it is that's, um, that, that's controlling all of this. I mean, just, just as a sort of a, a bit of a picture of sure. who's made these decisions, that'd be really appreciated. Sure. The change, board, change control board is not just um, Kelly and I. Um, we have about 15 or so um, individuals who have volunteered across the industry um, from um, vendors, from CROs, from sponsors, biotech, um, who get on a call um, once a month and we go through the requests. Um, typically when a request comes in, it's sent to the zone that that request is um, related to. And those individuals take a look at it. Um, th that group is not included in the change control board. It's a separate group of individuals who take a look at it and tell us, yes, that makes sense. No, it doesn't. Or um, maybe even modifies the request. Then it comes back to the change control board. The change control board takes a look at it. Um, agrees, disagrees, modifies whatever needs to be modified. For example, the definitions or um, some of the other columns within the reference model. Um, and then when we feel that we have enough, um, we send those on to the steering committee for their review and approval. Um, in some cases, there's a discussion that needs to be had. Um, to understand the actual requested change or the um, suggested change. Um, and in some cases, the steering committee says, you know, did you consider this? And it comes back to the change control board for additional discussion. Um, once we have a full package, um, we send out a new release based on the definitions that we have um, as to this being a major, minor, or a um, administrative type of change. Anything else, Karen, that I forgot to mention that might be helpful? No, I just suddenly crossed my mind as you were talking about it, that it was probably a good thing to explain how, yeah. are you still looking for members? I mean, are you still looking to expand? Are you always open to have new people involved? Yes, we're always open to have new people involved. Um, we recently had a number of people volunteer, so, um, you know, we'd love to have more, um, but um, it's not a big time commitment. Um, just typically an hour a month. Um, and as we get ready for a release, there is a lot of additional information, QC of documents and, and things that needs to be done. But for the most part, the um, time commitment is not that um, steep. Okay, fantastic. So, okay. If anyone's got any questions or anything they want to add or ask, either you know, speak up or stick something in the chat um, as we carry on through. So okay. um, the next slide I'm assuming, um, Joanne, was a transition slide across to the sub artifacts. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And I guess we can go to the next slide. And I think someone else is... Absolutely. So the first, so uh, Daniel Bennett, if you wouldn't mind, Daniel's uh, been very involved in the sub artifact group. And so Daniel's put together some very nice slides. So Daniel, over to you. Just tell me when to move the slides on. Hi, Karen. Will do. Hello. Hello. Thanks very much. Uh, at the risk of sounding like a Victorian medium, I, I hope you can all hear me. Oh, we can. I hope you're there. Yes. Good. Knock on the table, dim the lights and all that business. Right. Uh, here are some names. Uh, these, these are the people that we kept a record of for the sub artifact working group uh, led by Karen um, and not me, not me, Karen Schneider, I should <laughs> say that. Um, and uh, with with many people ducking in and out, uh, this was quite an extended, quite a long project. Uh, and so not everyone was involved from beginning to end. 
Um, I had yes, a long project. I had a, a full head of hair, and when I started this, I no longer do. And I'm pretty sure Jimmy Carter was the president of the United States, but uh, maybe I'm misremembering the exact dates. But uh, uh, a huge thank you to all the people who who um, offered their time and their thoughts on this. Um, and, and also on behalf of their companies uh, offered uh, an insight into sharing uh, good practice and their ideas. So next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so at the very beginning, we, we asked everyone we could think of, um, what, what are you doing with some artifacts? What sub artifacts you got? What, what is missing from the model? Um, and uh, we, we asked that just in an open forum. We asked it around the industry. Uh, it went to the members of the working group, particularly, and the, the, the members of the other subgroups. Um, and, and answers came back. Next slide, please. Oh, wrong way, wrong way. Nope. Sorry, sorry. That's a map uh, Yes, answers came back. And we received a, a fair number, slightly more than five, in fact. Uh, lists of, of sub artifacts or types of documents or document types. Um, and they were some, uh, a couple of them were essentially sort of 250 items long, uh, but most of them seemed to come in at about a thousand items. So that appeared to be um, some form of standard. And, and just for comparison, of course, there were 250 artifacts. So that's something like four sub artifacts per artifact as a sort of rough rule of thumb. Uh, although it should be noted that some of those sometimes in some cases were because people were giving different names to documents which were occurring at different levels. So uh, a site ICF is distinct from a country ICF, um, which itself might be distinct from a, an ethics committee uh, ICF. So templates. So uh, some of that is explained by that. But essentially, people were using um, lists of about a 1000 long. So next slide, please. What's my mouse? There you are. Uh, and in a particularly a brave piece of work, uh, Shah took on the task of combining everything that we had been given uh, into one enormously long list, which is quite a thing to behold. Um, one for its sheer length and, and two for the enormous amount of repetition uh, that is then generated. Uh, so we came to a list which was about 5,000 sub artifacts long. Uh, and the first step there obviously was to remove exact duplicates where people were just using the, the name of the artifact or something tremendously obvious uh, so that we just had one copy of that. So we went through striking out that list and we still had an awful lot of things left. Next slide, please. So we broke it into zones and we went through zone by zone. Um, and essentially we looked at what questions do we, what questions do we need to ask when we're doing this? And of course the first the first question really is, is what is a, a sub artifact? Uh, what are we trying to identify here? Um, because there's a temptation to just add a fourth level of, of filing to, to the model. Um, so zone, se section, artifact, and then, and then a fourth level beyond that. Um, and that, as it turns out, probably wasn't the original goal and, and probably wasn't very helpful and would probably slow everyone down and create an awful lot more misfiling. So that's not the game. Uh, so what are we trying to find when we find sub artifacts? Uh, next slide, please. Yep. So if each artifact is uh, highlights uh, a regulatory need, a compliance need that there should be, there should be something there to meet that need, then sub artifacts are the ways that different people have adopted to do this. And uh, you'll see highlighted in um, a sort of tomato ketchup color uh, that other ways are possible. So there's a distinction here between what, what's mandated and, and what is, what is option, optional. Um, that with all these sub artifacts, this is a way of doing it. It's not strictly essential that you do it the way we say. So, certainly not, yes. Um, 
when we are having these discussions about, well, is this useful? Is this helpful? Is this generalizable? Would would people want this? Because uh, we were constantly trying to think of, um, you know, it applies to CROs and sponsors. It applies to very big companies and very small companies. Um, could we could we conceive of a use where you would ever ask the question, how many of these documents have we got, uh, such that you would want a report that that uh, distinguished between them? So. The, the kind of bottom line was, could we think of any use for reporting on it? And that was the, that was the final line. Next slide, please. Uh, as an example, 527 site staff training qualifications is a location where you sometimes get an awful lot of documents piled in together. And even if you've got the metadata of the person on there, um, you can still end up with a bunch of certificates for that person. So the sub artifacts distinguish between the types of qualification. I think they also have medical license and uh, one or two others in there as well on the grounds that you might want to have a quick look and just be able to tell the difference between a GCC, GCP certificate and a uh, handling transporting dangerous goods certificate. Uh, so that was that was the kind of the final analysis of why did we think you might want a sub artifact for this? Why did you want to tell it apart from all the other documents? If you're answering questions like this, um, has this person got a GCP certificate? Has this person got four GCP certificates? Does someone at this site have an IATA certificate without opening them all and looking at them? Uh, then hopefully uh, the sub artifact would allow you to see that. Next slide, please. The most difficult case, however, was for informed consent forms. So for, uh, for ICFs, there are essentially uh, sub artifacts named slightly differently, but similar to this in that uh, we recognize you sometimes see ICFs, you see addenda, you see uh, checklists where people QC and approve them, and you see summary of changes. Uh, often that's a track change version uh, of one version to another. So those are the different documents that you see jammed into that one location. And it would be really good to tell them apart. There is, of course, a second category that you could do as well. So if we can have the um, another click, please, Karen. Thanks. Uh, you also want to be able to tell the difference between your main ICF and any other ICFs that you are using through the trial. Through the trial, sorry. Um, and we went back and forth on which of these should be the sub artifact. Uh, and in fact, it's the it's the list that we went with because that's more similar to what we're doing elsewhere. But personally, if I was configuring a system tomorrow, uh, I'd have metadata fields for both of those. So I'd, I'd have sub artifact as a metadata label. I'd have type of ICF as a metadata label for the ICF one. Uh, but we decided it, it went that way around. So that's a sort of insight into the kind of decisions we were trying to make. Next slide, please. So. Having completed this project and uh, grown old, old in the meantime, the uh, notable features are that sub artifacts are, well, essentially, to my mind, they are suggestions. It's one way that you might tell things apart. They're all doing the same job. I imagine that for any particular instance, any implementation, it could be modified extensively. One of the areas where we gained quite a lot of sub artifacts was in the area of review and approval. So uh, it's mentioned in the descriptive text along with, for example, the plans that uh, evidence of, of a plan being carried out and forms that show things being done can be formed into the same, filed into the same artifact. Uh, there's a little bit more guidance on that. There's a little bit more examples of uh, the kind of thing that you might see. So uh, in line with GCP and the EMA guidance, uh, sorry, MHRA guidance, uh, the idea that evidence of your QC processes being TMF content, well, it's called out slightly more often in the sub artifacts than it was previously. Uh, and there's 612 artifacts approximately 
uh, in the list. <laughs> Next slide, please. Ah, we've lost the slide with, um, what was it called? The alternative names. Oh, did I miss a slide out? Oh, you're going to have to just talk it through then. Sorry, Daniel. Yeah, I, yeah. I had lots of versions flying around, and I think maybe that might, have got, it might have got left out. Sorry about that. Cool, no problem. Um, essentially, yeah, as part of doing this, we, we, we've, we've added a column which has got a lot of document names in the model. Uh, we didn't feel that it, it we, well, what shall I say? We, we felt it was getting harder to, to understand. When you put that next to the alternative names column, it, it was getting harder to understand. Why, um, I, I was a little unsure, um, not, not putting this on the rest of the group, but I was unsure why you would want a list of documents um, uh, that other people use the names in your model. So the the, the, the reference model is, is implemented for, for a particular company, when you implement it, you should be putting what you call the documents into the text there. There's, there's no great need to keep what other people might call that document. Um, if you're a giant pharma company, then you might well have several filing models, in which case you'll have several columns where you put your names, but you still don't need a column for what other people call them. Uh, you know, if you have a special relationship with a particular CRO, you can you can meet with them and you can agree on what you both call it and you can have a column for that. Um, it's, it's only Excel after all. Uh, but uh, it, it, was, it was a column that made a lot of sense at the beginning when the model was new and when there was a lot of diversity in what things were called. Um, as, as the model is now 10 years old and has an increasing, uh, increasingly widespread use, perhaps it makes uh, it makes sense to kind of, ah, oh, there we go. That's the one. <laughs> How about that? On the yeah. fly, amazing slideshows. Well, top, top job. Uh, cool. <laughs> so it made sense when the model was new and unfamiliar. Uh, it, it perhaps makes less sense now. But again, that's very much on the basis that, you know, that information is still useful. It's just not necessarily something that you need to keep in the implemented, in the implemented model. Cool. Thank you, Karen. Thank you very much, and I do apologise. As I said, I had lots of people throwing things at me, and unfortunately, it got lost. But you got there. You got the slide in the end, so that's good. So brilliant. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you very much to Karen Schneider and the whole team. Shah, you're a star as well. Um, what I would like to do is just ask Todd very quickly to talk about what the steering committee did um, when it came to the sub artifacts. So, Todd, over to you. Sure. Hi, everybody. This is Todd Tolis from the steering committee. Uh, and I think as Daniel underscored, this is a pretty significant effort and project, a lot of new information and questions being thrown out as to what shall we do to, to achieve the, the objective of the sub artifact column. Uh, and as you can see from the steering committee perspective, it took us a year actually to do our review of all that work. And uh, just so everybody knows the steering committee, just like everybody else here is a volunteer on the effort. We actually have a scheduled meeting every two weeks, so twice a month we meet. Uh, and I can recall many of these meetings where we just spent time ticking through the list and uh, discussing. We also, we also ended up having to kind of craft our own guidance as to our review guidance and our rules of the road and, and make that written so that everybody could kind of follow it. And you can imagine the steering committee has a lot of experienced folks on it. Um, so there was some healthy discussion uh, about things like getting rid of the alternate names, and how sub artifacts relate to what is also currently referred to in the model as progeny records related to an artifact. Uh, and so in attempting to clarify that and walking through that and going back to the sub team for, for clarification and understanding uh, took, us, took us quite some time. But I think the, the thing we really wanna communicate is, is we learned a couple things out of this process. Uh, and, and one of those was to make sure that, that you know, we, you know, we provide more guidance at kickoff and ongoing to sub teams, uh, you know, like I said, the steering committee has a lot of experienced folks from different perspectives, uh, and and when it comes time to to approve reference model deliverables, you know, we want that to be a fairly seamless process. Um, so I think part of part of our our charter needs to be to, to provide more guidance uh, to sub teams at the outset in terms of expectations and, and maybe certain uh, guardrails. But then the the other thing that, that really came up during this that we we've, we've resolved by updating the, the charter of the change control board is that really the change control board is the owner 
uh, for approving outputs that impact the Excel sheet, right? So the, imp the that Excel sheet, Change Control Board owns it. And when we started this process, the steering committee was a little bit in the way of that. And so we're trying to get out of the way of doing that and letting the Change Control Board own it. So we learned some things over this process. Uh, we think we got to a good end here. Uh, we hope that everybody uh, enjoys and can give some good feedback on what they see. Uh, and I think our next step is to talk a little bit about what uh, what it might mean to take this new version and implement it. Brilliant. Thanks, Todd. Much appreciated. So we are going to call on a panel. And I know there's already been a couple of questions um, that I've been asked about this. So we're going to have four people join the panel. So Joanne Malia and Kay Robinson, who are on the Change Control Board. Lisa Mulcahy. I'll get, actually, I'll get everyone to do their own introduction and Paul Fenton. But before we do that... What I'd like to do is just throw up a quick poll and say, can you just tell us at the moment what version of the reference model you're using? Um, thank you very much as everyone's voting. So we actually have 262 people on this call, which is amazing. Um, right, for those three people who are not using the reference model, four, We'll come and get you. Um, no, I'm joking. It's absolutely fine. Um, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, so actually, that's interesting. Okay, so hang on a second. Oh, you can't see the results, can you? That's that's true. Only I can see them at the moment. So 182 people have. That's amazing. 182 people have voted in 46 seconds. Um, just while we're just leaving off the last couple of votes. Um, uh, one of there was a question about how you would get the copy of the slides. So what's going to happen is the slides are going to be posted on tmfrefmodel.com, and there will also be a recording of this posted on tmfrefmodel.com, um, and where you can have all the slides, um, all the information. So no worries at all. Okay, 186. I think that's about it. So end the polling and share the results. So that's really interesting. Um, if someone could just capture that, please, snip it. That means everyone's going to do it. Aaron, you're on. Can you snip it and send it to me, please? Already done, Karen. Thank you. Because um, it's so funny, you ask someone to do it and then suddenly everybody does it. Um, so really nice to see that most people are using version 3.1. Um, there may be some interesting comments about about a mixture of versions. Um, what I'd like to do now is if it's okay, I'm gonna take down the slides. And can I ask everybody on the panel, please, to um, put their video on. Hang on, let me stop sharing, there you are. Put your video on, and come and say hi. And then I also have a way, oh, someone quickly shout out how you do it. How do I make it so that only the people that have their cameras on show? Oh, Rachel, I, sorry, Rochelle, I only wanted the people who were on the panel to be putting their cameras on, if you wouldn't mind. Sorry, not everybody, guys. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So Paul, Joanne, Lisa, Kelly. And then can somebody please remind me how you on, get it? On, on your picture, there hover over the top right corner, there's three little blue dots and you select- Spotlight, it. pin. Uh, you should have choose hide non-video participants. Oh. On your, if you go to, you do it on your picture. Oh, hide non-video participants, participants. There you are. And now I've actually put me in the middle. I didn't mean to do that. How do I get rid of myself? Remove pin. There you are. Excellent. So Mel, you're, you're still up in the middle of my screen. How do I? Hey, hey Karen. Yes, it's Kelly. Hey, I'm not going to put my video on. I was not prepared for video this morning. <laughs> oh, no worries at all. No worries at all. No worries at all. I probably should have warned you. Anyway, yes, okay. you should have warned me. Lisa, Lisa, that just makes everyone want to see you more. No. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, Lisa, too. No worries at all. Okay, right. So, um, Paul, can you start off? Quick intro as to who you're representing here today. Well, sure. Are, so, um, hi everybody. I'm Paul Fenton. Um, I'm uh, primarily representing the Exchange Mechanism Standard subgroup um, that I co-chair. 
uh, with Alvin, um, and I'm also a vendor, of course, and the CEO of Modrium. Nice to see so many of you on the. So your audio isn't so great, Paul. Is that me or is that just Paul? In the country, I'm going to I'm going to turn my video off, unfortunately, because That's my fine. connection so Janice, isn't great. It's just you, it's just um, you and me. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, did did you hear me, or would you like I did. to say that? No, we heard you. You just sort of fluttered at the end, so that's fine. Um, okay, okay, great. So, Joanne, if you wouldn't mind just doing a quick introduction of yourself. Sure, um, I'm Joanne Melia. I um, am part of the Change Control Board, but my regular day job is uh, the head of the TMF for Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. So I will be a sponsor on this panel. And Kelly? Hi, everybody. Uh, Kelly Robinson. I've uh, been in the industry for 20 years. I lead the Change Control Board with Joanne. And I actually um, come with a, a good perspective of once being with a very large pharmaceutical company, and now being with a very small, uh, a very small company. Excellent. I'm, you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to put a slide, the slide back up one second so that um, um, we can actually have the pictures of the people there. So, so because it's definitely not just going to be me there. So one second, one share screen, share screen. That's what I need to share. <coughs> share. Right. Fantastic. And Lisa, if you wouldn't mind just quickly doing an introduction. Hi everyone, it's Lisa Mulcahy and I am a consultant for companies very large and very small, very small, sometimes an N of one in clinical operations. And uh, I, will be I will be representing um, mostly from the smaller group, but um, from any, any type of process uh, perspective. Fantastic. So we've got 15 minutes left. So I've got a number of questions that I'd like to ask if you wouldn't mind, guys. Um, the, the, the first question I think I would like to sort of really cut straight to is, is in terms of your companies and the companies that you're dealing with. You know, people worry that, well, version 3.2 has come out now. You know, what, what do I need to do? And from your company perspective, what do you see as the impact and do you think you will be changing to version 3.2 or where are you in that thought process? And maybe I can start with you, Joanne, um, as, um, as a sponsor. So have you, where are you in terms of your thought process and what, what do you think the impact's gonna be? Sure, um, we have already been um, dealing with some sub artifacts in our TMF. So I think for us, we will just need to do an impact analysis and determine what are those other recommendations that we may want to um, consider, um, and then have those blessed by our subject matter experts or our functional leads that um, make up the TMF. Um, additionally, since it's in our TMF, we need to do change controls to make sure that the, um, our inventory list um, based on the reference model is in alignment with our system. So it will take us a short period of time to evaluate and to implement that. And one of the questions that I know, and I'm going to come to everybody else to ask the question is, will you do it for all your studies? So will you do retrospective changes or will you just apply changes to, on, to, to future studies? We would have to do this um, for all of our active studies. Mm -hmm. um, so it may be though that we would um, not actually implement it um, on some studies that are close to ending, but the way our system works, um, we can't change that for a specific study. So the artifact or sub artifact would be there. We may just choose not to use it at that point. No problem at all. Kelly, from a sponsor perspective, from a you know, obviously a different sponsor perspective, is your how does your your view or your thought process change differ from Joanne's? Are you aligned or have you got different sort of approach you're going to take? So I think Joanne and I are aligned. Um, coming from a small startup company now, you know, we we pretty much took the reference model, um, you know, as is and then used 
the sub artifact, AKA alternate name to put in our own um, examples of documents that would be filed to that particular artifact. So I, you know, I think we're, what we do is on a quarterly basis, we um, update our study um, document list and we're going to go ahead and, and take version 3.2 and do exactly what Joanne said and look for the impacts um, on each of the studies. Um, we're fortunate we don't have a lot of studies, so, um, but we'll, we'll make the changes there and, and we would make those changes, um, you know, going forward for, uh, for all the studies. Okay. Lisa, from your perspective, obviously you, you deal with lots of different, as a consultant, you deal with lots of different clients and I know you've got a reasonable number of, of sort of smaller clients. What's the general, um, uh, their general thoughts and what people, what concerns have people raised to you about changing versions and what are your, how would you recommend people approach it? Thanks, Karen. So the first thing I would actually, uh, since, since my uh, clients uh, use all different types of uh, ETMF vendors, the first thing we would do is rely on the vendor to, um, or that conversation with the vendor to see what their plan is uh, for the implementation of version 3.2. And so we have to work closely with our ETMF vendors, right, to understand how they're going to manage it, as well as then evaluate our process. The second thing is I would take, ask everybody to just take a breather. Um, all of this content is helpful, but if you don't implement it immediately, you're not out of compliance, right? Um, however, however, you are already managing your sub artifacts in your TMF. It's just what we have to do because we have a lot of bucket documents or bucket artifacts. So I wouldn't say take a breather and, and, and wait for two years. I would actually just say, okay, take a breather. Let's let's get aligned with our our vendor, and then and then put our plan in place, right? What are we going to do? Is it critical? How many trials are impacted? And like Kelly and Joanne said, it really depends on can you have different models for different trials, you know, reference model versions for different trials, or whether or not it's an all or none. And then, like Joanne said, some trials may not put the process in place to utilize the the sub artifacts that you have. The other piece that I'm going to ask people to just kind of be care, calm about is that you may call it approval of the informed consent, but maybe it's the informed consent approval on the, on the, on the reference model. And so try not to get hung up on those different names of the artifacts that are coming. And know that the sub artifacts that are being proposed um, here in the reference model in 3.2 is not the end all be all because every company is different, right? And so you have to also say, well, we don't use that one. So do we have to create it? No, that's not what the artifacts, you know, are listed here for. They're, it's rather evaluated, keep the ones that you need, um, maybe add a few more that you've already added into your process. Thanks, Lisa. It's really interesting that you that you say, you know, make sure you you talk to your vendors. So just for everyone's um, knowledge, we actually emailed or contacted all the vendors uh, through the people who have been involved in the exchange mechanism um, with a um, uh, sort of a bit more detailed idea about about the uh, sort of a heads up effectively, because you're right, the, your vendors should be able to guide you and help you through what do we need to do and how are we going to do it. Um, so, um, Paul, that's a perfect uh, segue to you. I'm hoping your snowstorm means you're back. Paul? Hey, Karen, if he's not, if I also might add, there are still a few companies that are paper and not bad, not, not bad, not good. And, you know, sub artifacts or subfolders, right? And so just try to not get hung up and create a subfolder waiting for every one of these documents. It still requires the same process of evaluation if you have a paper TMS. No, absolutely. Um, Paul, are you by any chance yes. there? Hey! I, I, I am sorry. I'm sorry. We, we're having a snowstorm in my, uh, uh, my yeah, internet I, and electricity. No, that's awesome. Yeah, I know already. It's like, yeah. anyway, sorry, I'm here. 
So uh, I don't know if you heard anything I said, but basically I was uh, saying that, you know, talking about vendors and your vendors helping and we've actually already yeah. had a question is how would the exchange mechanism get impacted and as now the alternate names are no longer in use, etc. So what's sure. your sort of thought process from a vendor perspective and specifically around the EMS? Yeah. Working okay on. can you can you guys hear me yes go yes yes okay i'm going to speak really fast just in case it cuts out again so uh, within the exchange mechanism we already um uh, you know made provision for sub artifacts and there's a, uh, a metadata tag where you can actually um, store the sub artifacts name that you've chosen um, I think what, what's really important is, um, as a vendor, is to think about well, what's the best way to implement this. Um, and Daniel actually um, spoke earlier about using metadata as a way of encapsulating um, sub artifact names. And I think that's the way to go as, as a vendor. That's what we would do. We would actually uh, create a, 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 a metadata tag sub artifact. And then afterwards, when somebody chose the artifact in question, because Remember, it's really important to always link back to an artifact. We would then present the list of sub artifacts that were available. Uh, and we would make it so that this list would be um, uh, customizable for each client. So that there's a lot of flexibility because remember, sub artifacts, are, they're just a suggestion. You know, they're, they're, they're an example of what you could have um, uh, as a sub artifact, but it doesn't mean to say you can't create your own or, or even modify the ones that we're proposing. Um, and that's why I think, you know, it's, it's good to have it as a piece of metadata, but make sure you always link back to the artifact ID. And if you're using the exchange mechanism or plan to use it, um, you know, be aware that we've already thought about that. And there's a way for you to, to communicate the sub artifact name, as well as the, uh, the artifacts that you've linked to. Thanks, and Paul, I hope appreciate that everybody heard that. Uh, we did absolutely no, no I definitely heard you no problem at all Good. appreciate it i think that going to the point of speaking to your vendors because you know every every technology system will um will effectively be able to be configured differently people will be able to do different things so there may be an option of um either having to say right we need to to uh, take the the structure and change it for all our studies. There may be an option where your vendor might be able to say, well, actually, we could implement a new structure with so that it's just for the new studies ongoing. Which is why it's important that the technology vendors around the table all understand what they're going to say to their to their clients. And that's why at Lisa's point about going back and talking to your technology um, vendor is very important. A couple of other questions, um, Sabrina. We do have a question um, from you about the exchange mechanism. Um, I'm going to ask you to email Paul Fenton, pfenton at montrium.com. Um, and, um, oh, thank you, Eldon. I was going to say, Eldon's put up a, um, a link to the exchange mechanism, but I'm sure you're welcome to email Paul as well. Um, yep, absolutely. And then there was another comment about while doing the mapping of artifacts from CRO to pharma or vice versa, the alternate name is an important and plays an important role to map the artifacts. Now, is there any impact in mapping? And I wonder if anybody wants to, either Joanne, Kelly, Paul or Lisa, wants to comment on not having the alternate name column in terms of mapping artifacts. Um, we keep the alternate name <laughs> um, because we use it with our CROs. Mm -hmm. um, so each CRO tends to call a type of document something different. So we use it for that. Um, and also, um, if an SOP changes, sometimes the, the um, document changes names. So we might have both in there. So that's how we tend to use it. And, and Joanne, that sounds to me like you've, you've made the alternate name and an alternate name column a, a customized thing. It's specific to you. You've put Correct. names that you want in there. And, yeah. and I believe a lot of people do that where they are specific as opposed to using a generic alternate name. And I know from the, all the discussions we've had about the alternate name, the challenge is that there was this overlap and confusion um, between the alternate name column and the sub artifact name column. And some of the ones in alternate were actually sub artifacts, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's, we've simplified the model itself, but the principle of using an alternate name where you go in and you say, okay, CRO number one, 
calls it X and CRO number two calls it Y um, and you put map it into your model, I think is quite common. Uh, Kelly, Lisa, Paul, any comments on that? Hey, it's Lisa. So the reference model is a reference model for a reason, right? Because we all have, um, every company has a little bit different. And so um, nothing is, is stopping anybody from adding that column back in if it's a valuable common uh, uh, column for you. But as Karen and Daniel you know, did describe, as the, as the industry moved to common taxonomy, naming an organization of the content through the TMF reference model, the content that was in th those cells actually were more confusing than not. So mm -hmm. it's merely now a process instead of giving people examples of what, what that content was what's in that artifact. Absolutely. So it would be beneficial for a CRO maybe to, to, to use the alternate column or for a sponsor either way in terms of for their practice, but not generically available. Um, I'm aware that we are two minutes away from the end. Uh, Joanne, Kelly, Lisa, Paul, anything specific that you would like to um, mention as a sort of a summary um, with regards to 3.2? This is Kelly. So I just want to remind everybody, you know, when you're looking at this, you know, everybody needs to adapt the reference model to reflect your own company, you know, SOPs and processes. So just keep that in mind, you know, when you're doing your evaluations um, of the changes. Okay. I would also say if you if you're going to introduce the concept of sub artifacts into your system, which I think you should, because it's you know it's great to have that um, that additional granularity so to make it easier to find things just make sure that everybody understands exactly how to use them uh, within your organization once you release it fantastic anybody else absolutely okay excellent well i would like to say um, a thank you very very much to everybody on the change control board everybody on the sub artifact committee everybody on the panel um, it's been a huge effort and it is much appreciated. So as a very, very final, um, there are a couple of questions we haven't answered. I will try and get to them separately. Um, as a final, just to say that there is an, uh, um, an ETMF uh, forum going on right now um, and that's today and tomorrow. And then there's the um, um, TMF summit next week, second to the sixth. And can I just say, couple of things it's going to be fun there's a few of us who are who are involved who are going we're going to try and make it a bit of fun so do come along um i don't know about all of these conferences but i know that the the fierce one is actually free to people who are uh, sponsors biotechs or operational people in cro's um so um do come along um to that and oopsie, 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 oopsie. And um, there's obviously, there's all the other one that's really important to mention, otherwise Jamie will kill me, is there is an elect, e the email communication guidance. There's going to be a workshop held in January, one to one and a half hours. Um, so make sure you put that. And then IQPC is next year. So that's the events coming up. And without that, just to say the last one is going to be the 7th of December. So come along for a bit of Christmas cheer. Maybe we'll all get dressed up in Christmas hats because um, I'm not sure what Christmas is going to be like this year. Um, so we hope to see you then. And um, if you, at, at the back of the presentation, there's just information on joining. So without further ado, I'm going to leave it on that one to say thank you very, very much. Everybody stay safe. Um, I hope everybody's well and um, uh, look after yourselves and we will see you on the 7th of December. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Karen. Thank Thanks, you. guys. Thank you, Karen. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.